faith. Uh, to recap, we've journeyed through different seasons that we go through in our faith that also coincide with the seasons of the church year, which we will enter next week. As seen here on this slide, we can see all the different seasons that we will move through. So next week is the first Sunday of Advent, and that is a season of waiting, anticipation, um, and preparing for Christ's birth and waiting to celebrate that, but then also waiting again to receive Christ again as he comes again. And then we move into Christmas, which is the season of like joy and wonder and marveling at this baby who was the Messiah. And then we move into a season of Epiphany, which is the revelation that Christ is the Messiah, which moves us into Lent, where we recognize our need for Christ and our need for our Savior. But then we don't hang out there for too long, and then we move into Easter, where we get to have a resurrected hope that Christ will restore us and make us new. And then we spend the majority of our time walking in the ordinary seasons uh, with Jesus during the unmarked and unnamed seasons of faith. And so as we make our way through these the next year, uh, we're excited to begin this journey with you. Um, let's see. I moved too far ahead. Now where am I? <laughs> Um, I did too good. Um, so I've been looking forward to exploring the season that we're in right now, the season of the ordinary, and talking about this sermon today because it's the one that we spend the most of our time in, both in the church year but also in our faith. If we were to look at our lifespan, if we journeyed it out, uh, we would see that our lives are comprised of the ordinary for the most part. And so I've actually done the work myself and I plotted out my lifespan of some of the major parts of my life that have been really impactful for me, whether in my life or in my faith. And so starting with my birth, I don't remember it, but it was pretty important because I'm here. Uh, so I marked that at the beginning. That's pretty eventful. Uh, but then about eight years passed, eight or nine years passed, before I really accepted what Christ had done for me and became a Christian. And then we continue along the path until we get to NYC, and that is where I started to have inklings that maybe I was called to ministry. I was serving on a worship team at that time, and I was like, well, this is ministry, and so maybe I'm just supposed to continue just doing what I'm doing. Um, but then and there, God started to kind of plant that seed that maybe ministry was what God was calling me to. Um, that was eight years after I had been a Christian. And then about two years later was that I graduated from high school, and that was a pretty memor memorable moment in my life. And then four years passed, and I graduated from college. Um, but in that time, that's when my call to ministry was affirmed. And about two years later, I headed overseas to Ireland and spent some time as a student missionary over there, serving and working with a church plant in the town of Wicklow Town. And then a year later after that, Dan and I got married, uh, and then we moved a year later to Yakima, Washington, where we began uh, ministering together in a church. And then a, a year later, <laughs> a year later, uh, both of us graduated from seminary. So that was pretty a big, solid chunk right there, year after year after year. But then some other time passed, about four years passed, and Dan and I were ordained, and we had our first child, Phoebe. Um, and then we moved again about two years later, and we had Finley. And so those are pretty the memorable moments of my life that I can remember um, along my lifespan that stick out to me. But as you can see, those are just moments and little blips along my whole lifespan. And the whole line, the line that's green, is like the ordinary time of my life that passes by, that I'm continuing to walk with Jesus, and Jesus is with me, and we're growing together in a relationship. And so if we were to look at our lifespans, we each come from different paths. Um, but overall, our lives are marked by these ordinary moments, the day-to-day -day moments. And this is true of our faith journeys. We have those moments where we have yet to know God, moments where we can see and experience God so clearly, we feel like we're like on a mountaintop. But we also have those moments where we're wondering where God is. But overall, we continue to journey in faith in the day-to-day -day moments of our life, moments of the ordinary. 
In scripture, we see that there are moments where the disciples are living life together in the ordinary moments, but still walking with Christ, whether they know it or not. Today, we go back a little less than 2,000 years ago and place ourselves in this story with the disciples where, we, where they find themselves off the shore of Galilee. So let's meet them there as we turn to John chapter 21, verses 1 through 13. And if you are able, I would invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. <laughs> Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, and have breakfast. None of, the, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This is the word of the Lord. Be you may be seated. <coughs> this little narrative of the disciples and Jesus comes after Jesus had been crucified, risen, and appeared again to the disciples in the upper room. John chapter 20 narrates these events. And so here we are, a chapter later in chapter 21, where the disciples are again by themselves, hanging out by the Sea of Galilee, and they decide to go fishing. I chose this passage because I like what it does. I like that it portrays the disciples doing something ordinary. Fishing was something that was common during their time, especially as it was more so to provide sustenance for themselves or to make a bit of money rather than some type of recreational sport that we do today. But in the Gospel of John, John doesn't say that these disciples are fishermen. John paints a slightly different picture of the disciples as more so men just trying to make a living and trying to get by. And I think we can relate to that. We pick up little jobs here or there to get by or to make a little extra income. And with the holidays around, some of us may or may have in the past uh, picked up a seasonal job to bring in a little extra income during these months. And so here in the scripture, we have these men by the sea hanging out to fish, either for themselves or to sell or perhaps both. What I also like about this passage is how it paints Jesus as a typical guy on the shore. The disciples don't realize that it's Jesus until a little later. For as much as they know, this guy is on the beach tending a fire and inviting them to breakfast. And what a nice gesture of hospitality, which I think we can also relate to. With the table dinner ministry that we have going on here at the church, some of us are hosts and some of us are guests and some of us are both. But we all get to practice hospitality by showing up and being guests or by hosting people in our homes and sharing a meal together. And these meals that we share together each month happen among the ordinary moments of our lives. But something so ordinary as sharing a meal together 
is very meaningful. And if you'd like to be a part, Pastor Maureen will be out there at the table in the back. You can, you can sign up uh, to be a host or a guest. But before I really go any further and dive into this passage, I want to unpack the scripture a little bit more and pose some questions for us to think about that arise from scripture. The first question that comes up from this passage is, who is your community? Who is your community? The disciples had one another for community. We see them even after Jesus died and was taken away from them that they are still together. John lists out of the original 12, there are seven together by the sea. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John, and then two others, so we have seven. These disciples once before did not hang out with each other, except for the brothers, but as a whole, the disciples were a group that Jesus brought together and formed together as he called them to be his disciples. And even after Jesus leaves them, this group remains connected. And it's not just this one incident that we see them together. Like I said in chapter 20, the disciples are together in the upper room and there Jesus appears to them for the first time. And then he appears again to them later on when Thomas is with them. These disciples could have disbanded right when Jesus died. Jesus was the person that brought these guys together and who was the common denominator for this group. But this group remained intact, and it gives us a slight indication of what was to come, that through Jesus, we would be connected and united through him. But not only that, but that we are called to be together, fellowshipping together, worshiping together and caring for one another, which were some of the things that we talked about in the last sermon series on the early church. Jesus is a part of the Holy Trinity, comprising of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And together, the Trinity is relational at its core. And as we are invited into a relationship with Jesus, as we are made in the image of God, we are relational beings, and we have a need to be in relationship with others and with God. And so even though all of us come from different walks and different paths of faith and of life, we come together on Sunday mornings or Mondays with the Youth Girls Discipleship Group or Tuesdays in the Guys Youth Discipleship Group or Wednesdays with Wednesday Night Live or the Men's Fellowship Time in the Morning. Just some of the ways that we come together each week drawn together by God and our unity in Christ. And we are a living, breathing sign of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God on earth. And it's so amazing to stand up here and to see each and every one of you coming from all different walks and paths of life. We're all together under one roof, worshiping the same God and united in that together. Amen. Amen. Uh, gives me chills. And so as a group made up of different backgrounds and beliefs and thoughts and opinions, we can come together in peace and worship and fellowship together. We can greet one another on Sunday mornings and say we are together. We bring peace to this world, and we can offer hope to our world where peace and unity are really hard to come by these days. A few months ago, I met with one of our young adults as we were thinking about, you know, potentially starting up a young adult ministry here at the church, and I asked her what keeps her coming to church. What makes her wake up in the morning and get to church? And her response was the people that she gets to see here on Sunday mornings. I then asked, why a young adult ministry? Why a young adult group? Because when you think about it, young adults are capable of having friends and creating their own groups themselves. I don't need to do that for them. They don't need Pastor JC to do that for them. They can do that on their own. But she said she really wanted to be a part of a faith community of people her own age. And so ever so slightly, we're making headway with a young adult group and a ministry, and we're even coming together with the Leavenworth Nazarene Young Adults and doing events together, and it's been so exciting to see and see how God is bringing this group of people together. But from this conversation with this young adult, 
I learned that even when we have the capability of creating our own groups, our own communities, we still have that innate desire for something more than we can do on our own. We desire a Christian community with others to do life with. And so as we are called to be in community and desire to be in community with each other, I want to ask, who is your community? Who do you surround yourself with? Who is within your sphere of influence? Do you make an effort to include people or groups who are helping encourage your walk with God? I get to be a part of the Girls Youth Discipleship Group on Mondays, and Pastor JC let me lead a discussion one Monday evening. <laughs> and I did the same exercise with the youth girls, and we wrote down the top five people who were around, and also the top five influencers or things that we hear. And here's my list. I even brought it with me this morning as an example. But maybe for us today, we extend that to the top 11 people we're around and the top groups or communities that we're a part of. And what would those groups of people look like? And are these people and groups supportive and encouraging of your faith? Or do they distract you from your faith? Community matters. Who we surround ourselves with matters, just as it did for the disciples. They needed one another as they continued to figure out life without Jesus physically present with them. And we need each other as we continue to figure out life in our present day and age and how to faithfully live as Christ followers in the ordinary moments of our lives. So thank you for being here. And thank you for coming and continuing to be here. And I hope that when you think about this question, who is your community, that our church is a part of that list. And if it's not, then perhaps another question to think about is, why not? And what needs to change or alter to make it be so? The second question that comes up is, do you have a sustainable faith? Do you have a sustainable faith? The disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus standing on the shore. And in many other resurrection appearances in the Gospels, Jesus is not recognized by those who were with him while he walked the earth. Resurrection faith is not inevitable. I'll say that again. Resurrection faith is not inevitable. And so that brings up the question, do we have a sustainable faith that is able to continue into the rest of the week, into the next disagreement we have with someone, into the next hard or joyful moment of our lives? In the passage with the disciples, the disciples' faith gets tested after a letdown. They went out to fish, and they had been fishing all night, but caught nothing. I haven't been fishing in a while, but it wasn't something that I looked forward to much when I was little and we went camping, because I never really had any luck of catching fish. Maybe you had similar experiences. However, when my family started camping at a different spot in Stanley, Idaho, we found our spot. If you know, yep, I'm hearing some, yep, <laughs> you know. When you find your spot, you have a spot. And fishing became more fun because I knew that my chances of actually catching a fish were good. However, if I had expected to get fish because we were at our spot and didn't, I would be sad. I'd be like, why not? This is where we always catch fish. My faith in that spot would have diminished a bit because my faith was in something that was more certain rather than something hoped for. The disciples are in a similar spot. They went out to fish. Again, fishing wasn't really a recreational sport back then. So to go out to fish just for fun wasn't really on these disciples' minds. They were expecting to get fish. And I know John doesn't really say these disciples are fishermen, but other Gospels will tell us that Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen, and so were the sons of Zebedee, James and John. In fact, Jesus calls them. He says, drop your nets and come with me. And so at least three people on this boat were fishermen. They knew what they were doing. And so they should have been able to catch some fish. 
But they go out, and all night they get nothing, not even one. So they're probably a bit sad. And their faith in themselves or in their spot or in their ability to fish has probably decreased a bit. And maybe we can even say their faith in Jesus has decreased a bit because Jesus keeps appearing and then disappearing. So when this guy on the shore calls to them and asks about their catch, their faith is a bit down, and they don't see that it's Jesus or even really think that maybe this is Jesus. They simply respond to this stranger and say, no. However, they must have had a little bit of faith because when the stranger says to cast their net, they do. Uh, maybe it was hopeful wishing, I don't know. And they actually catch fish. They're like, well, what do I have to lose? I haven't caught anything anyway, so let's just throw the net over. But it's not until after dark that they catch fish that John says the person on the shore is the Lord. It took another miracle for them to realize that Jesus was with them, helping them. In the ordinary moments of our lives, we typically don't get big miracles um, or direct signs that God is working or with us. Those are more so the mountaintop experiences that we have along our little life trajectory. And in those ordinary moments, it takes more of an active, sustainable faith for us to see the subtleties of God at work. But when we stop to notice or reflect back on our day or our week, we most often can point to a moment where we saw God. I'm not sure where the disciples' faith was in their ability to fish or in Jesus. Scripture doesn't say. But we can infer and we can criticize their seemingly lack of faith. But what I think instead we get from the scripture is a relatable example that these disciples, these people who were walking with Jesus, had moments where their faith wasn't strong and were still working on a sustainable faith. This gives us encouragement that we're not alone when we feel let down or discouraged. And in those moments, God can gift us with little miracles or signs that God is with us. But we have to be looking for those moments. John only realized it was the Lord because somewhere in his brain, Jesus came to mind and he wondered where he was. Because he wondered, he saw and realized where Jesus was, right there on the beach. As we live in the ordinary moments of our lives, do you have a sustainable faith to help you see and trust in God? Or is it only during the times when something really good or really bad is happening that you can more clearly see and turn to God? My prayer for all of us is that we come to have a faith that is sustainable for all moments and seasons of our lives, and we can notice God working in those unmarked and unnamed moments. The third question that comes up for us as we look back on this passage is, are you ready to swim? When Peter realizes who the man on the beach is, Peter wraps his outer garment around him and then jumps into the water while the other disciples tow the boat to shore with the fish they just caught. What's interesting about this part of scripture is that Peter clothes himself to swim ashore rather than just leave his garment on the boat to make it easier to swim. Commentators have noted that Peter and others would have most likely been fishing in the nude, actually, because they didn't have as many clothing changes as we do today. So they would spare their clothing for when they were done fishing, and they'd have nice dry clothes. But Peter, realizing it is Jesus on the shore, he makes a sharp decision, and he presents himself by wrapping the clothes around him before jumping in the water and swimming to see, to see him. I'm pretty certain that Peter was not thinking 2,000 years ago that his action to clothe himself would be put in commentaries, or that his action would make it into my sermon today to be used as an example. But here we are. <laughs> so thank you, Peter. <laughs> Peter makes himself presentable when he realized Jesus was with him. And so we are left with the question, are we ready to swim too and jump in the water to see Jesus? Or do we find ourselves still working on making ourselves presentable? I think Peter had the right response and can teach us something or remind us of something, maybe. 
Peter didn't take much time to make himself presentable. Peter was fast. Peter took his garment, wrapped it around him, and jumped. I think sometimes we get stuck in the preparing to swim part. We get stuck in the mindset that we have to be perfect or we have to have our life together to come to Jesus or even come to church. But what Jesus desires from us is to jump in the water, how we are, and to swim to him. We can clean up our act. We can omit words from our vocabulary. We can change or alter our appearances to make us look better. But none of that is what is needed for us to come to Jesus or will make us more Christ-like. Jesus wants us as we are. And as we come to Jesus and continue to come to Jesus, accepting and learning what Jesus offers us and teaches us, Jesus will transform us and the rest will follow. It's a matter of the heart, rather a matter of appearances. And the same is true of our church. You are welcome here, however you are. You have come this morning, and we are thankful that you woke up and entered into these doors. We are thankful that you responded to God, drawing us together for worship this morning. We're thankful for you choosing to deepen your relationship with God and to know God more and to know us more, to love God and to love others. And so wherever you find yourself on this faith journey, in the ordinary moments of your lives, ask yourself, are you ready to swim? Or is there something that is holding you back from jumping and swimming? The fourth and final question I'll ask this morning arose from studying the scripture is what is your response to Jesus' hospitality? I've been sitting with the scripture for quite a while, not just this past week, um, but actually since September when the pastors and I attended the district pastors and spouses retreat in Leavenworth. This passage was one that we reflected on and spent some time thinking about. And what stood out to me was how I imagined Jesus on the shore. I imagined Jesus sitting on a beach, stoking the fire, while some fish were being cooked over the fire. I imagined Jesus reclining by the fire with a content, warm, welcoming facial expression, inviting his disciples to bring some of the fish they've just caught and come and have breakfast. It's a nice, calming, ordinary image that I get. Despite everything that had just occurred weeks prior with his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his reappearances to the women and the disciples, Jesus is here content in an ordinary moment. Jesus is present. Jesus is welcoming and still extending himself to others by serving and welcoming them. He tells them, come, have breakfast, which we know means to break the fast. The disciples have been through a lot. They've been through grief. They've been through having their idea of a Messiah be altered and changed from what they were thinking would originally happen. And if you've been through a season of grief or lament or hardship, you know that it takes longer than just a few weeks to really process that experience and those feelings. Even years later, things come up and remind us of those moments or experiences that we went through, and it feels like, again, that experience just happened yesterday. So for Jesus to invite them just weeks after all this happened and say, come have breakfast, he's inviting them to break the fast, Jesus is here. We can eat and we can receive. We can be thankful and give thanks. What's also significant about this passage is that the last time Peter was around a fire was when he denied Jesus three times. When the guards come and take Jesus away, the Gospel of Luke accounts that Peter follows at a distance and then sits with others around a fire in the courtyard. 
There, people keep insisting that Peter was with Jesus, and he denies it three times. But at this fire, Peter comes face to face with the one he denied, but the one that overcame death. For Peter, he's not just responding with acceptance to Jesus' invitation of hospitality, but with humility and probably a lot of other feelings and emotions. But Jesus is still inviting Peter and the others to come and eat. And it appears that they all come and receive the bread and fish that Jesus offered them. The same hospitality Jesus offered to his disciples is the same hospitality that Jesus is offering us What is your response to Jesus' hospitality? Do you sit with Jesus? Do you even notice Jesus? Are you hesitant to approach? Are you skeptical, fearful? Or do you come with gladness, thanksgiving, joy, hope, and faith? I hope this image of Jesus on the beach sticks with you as it did with me. In an ordinary moment, in an ordinary time, in an ordinary way, Jesus comes to us and invites us to sit with him, to eat with him, to cozy up to the fire, and to receive his goodness, his love, his mercy, and forgiveness. There's nothing extraordinary that we need to do to get it. We can receive it today, tomorrow, and for all eternity in the ordinary, simple moments of our life. I'll end with this. As I was briefly scrolling, not scrolling, I just opened Facebook this morning, I came across a post by our dear friend Millie Watkins that was exactly where I was going with this sermon today. And as I clicked into the link to read her blog post, she pretty much summed up my sermon today. And I thought, how fitting and perfect it is to include it this morning. So I hope she doesn't mind that I share some of it today. I forgot to ask her this morning. (laughs) But she posted on Facebook, so you know, it's for the whole world to see. (laughs) Millie writes, Making my way along the gravel path, and there was a picture of a path um, through some woods. So making my way along the gravel, gravel path, sprinkled with the first fruits of autumn's golden leaves, my prayer became spontaneous. Lord, you were gentle with your followers on the road as they carried the burden of grief. Will you make it clear to me that you are here with me? I don't have to have answers to every question, but I need to know that I am not alone. As I kept going, the familiar steps of an ordinary walk in the woods became holy ground. God isn't scolding me for my sadness or demanding a stiff upper lip. The presence of Jesus, not the absence of grief, heals and restores. This assurance waxes and wanes. There are times of encouragement and times of deep loss. The lessons I take away from my walk along the road remind me to embrace the ordinary routines of my life and to invite Jesus to be present in whatever form those routines take. Faith lived to the full chooses to take simple steps of task, rest, sorrow, invitation, and trust. Some days are better than others, but no day lacks the reality that God is with me. Amen. What a gift. As I was ending my sermon this morning and thinking about it, I was like, I don't know, I feel like there might be something that I need to add. And then I open up Facebook and see her post, and I'm like, thank you, God. <laughs> Even in the ordinary moment of having my morning coffee, opening up my laptop to look at my sermon one last time, God gave me a gift and showed up and said, here you are. So thank you, God, and thank you, Millie. Thank you for choosing to be faithful. And I hope that it just brings us encouragement that whatever season we are going through, in the ordinary moments of our lives, we can walk with God, see God, and know that God is present, inviting us, welcoming us, and saying, come, have breakfast. Let me pray for us this morning. Almighty God, Gracious God, loving God, forgiving God, God in the ordinary moments of our lives. 
We thank you so much that even on a Sunday morning, we can have assurance that you are with us in the ordinary moments of a worship service. That no matter where we go, that you are always with us, inviting us into a relationship with you. God, for some of us here this morning, perhaps we haven't even accepted what you have offered to us. And so, God, we just ask that you would pour out your spirit on us and that you would help us understand more of who you are and be able to accept what you have offered to us. That when we repent of the ways that we have been living in the past and ask for forgiveness and say, God, I want you to make me new and take those things from me. And I want to live in the way that you are going. That you are already at work in us and making us new. And that we can become your children. And God, for some of us on the journey, in the ordinary moments of our lives, we're struggling a bit. And so for us today who are struggling, God, I pray that you would just be with us, reassuring us of your welcoming presence, of the hope that you can offer us, and give us little miracles and gifts that remind us that you're not too far away, but you're right there with us. And God, for the others of us who really do just find ourselves in the ordinary moments, I pray that we are able to have a sustainable faith where each and every day we can ask How is God at work in my life? And that as we reflect on the day, we see where you're at. That we can take time to to spend with you and to sit with you, have conversation with you, to sit by that fire with you, and just let you know how our day is going, and ask you to keep sustaining us for that day and for the days to come. And for others of us, we may be having mountaintop experiences. And for that, we are so thankful. And may we just remember those moments of joy and goodness and being right in your presence, God, ever so clearly. We thank you for this morning and for your word to us and just the reminders that you are with us in the ordinary moments of our lives and of our faith. We pray this in your name. Amen. As we prepare to depart, take these questions with you, or maybe one that stood out to you. Who is your community? Do you have a sustainable faith? Are you ready to swim? And what is your response to Jesus' hospitality? As you think about them, and we depart, I would invite you to stand and receive this benediction from Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and be glad, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. You're dismissed.